Good morning, everyone. Happy Tuesday morning. This is uh, Doug Farrar of Touchdown Wire of the USA Today Sports Media Group. The guy over there in the Billy Joel shirt this week. He went from Eagles to Billy Joel. Is Greg Cosell of NFL Films and ESPN's NFL Matchup. And Greg, regular season's about when are you filming the first NFL Matchup, which, of course, we all watch or DVR if we're on the West Coast. Yeah, it's usually a DVR event, unfortunately. Yeah. But uh, um, I don't control the time. You know, as I always say, I'm just a singer in a rock and roll band, Doug. You know, I don't okay. control that. Um, it uh, so we shoot our first show a week from Friday. Nice. Well, you and uh, Sal Pal and Darius Butler, great crew, and uh, we're looking forward to that. Well, this is kind of our final podcast slash video where we're doing more global thirty thousand foot view things. We'll get into regular season matchups next week, obviously, because we'll, we have a regular season. Uh, we did the five offenses we're most looking forward to watching last week. And, of course, the uh, compensatory thing is the five defenses we're most looking forward to watching in 2023. I wanted to go a little off track, though, on the subject of Isaiah Simmons real quick um, and sort of the problem of the multi-position player. Because they sell, Cardinals selected Simmons of the eighth pick in the in 2020 draft based on the multi-position sort of defensive weapon potential he showed. And, you know, the Giants trade for him. I don't think the Cardinals put him on the defensive line once this preseason. That's the only place Wink Martindale put him. So I, I think when we get into this whole, this guy can play six different positions and blah, blah, blah. It's like when the Steelers traded for Mika Fitzpatrick and okay, we'll make you a free safety 80% of the time. And he turned into like the best free safety in the league for a while uh, with these multi-position guys. I think it's a good time to kind of get into your thoughts on, being able to do all these different things as opposed to finding one's niche and really hammering that home. Well, I'm going to refer, I've had this conversation with a lot of coaches because I've been very curious myself, you know, people who know more than I do that have to actually coach, you know, it's yeah. easy to watch a guy and go, wow, he's a gifted athlete, you know, and obviously Simmons, you know, six four, two forty, body, yeah. beautiful, great athlete. Um, but the more I talk to coaches, the more I hear that the concept of multi-positional is really kind of a lot of garbage, that you have to play guys in a position. Yeah. And, you know, that's that's the way it is in the NFL. Now, does that mean that you can probably do two things? In other words, we know that there are, let's say, safeties or who can play slot corner. We know that there are outside corners who can become slot corners, th that kind of thing. But if you're talking about players who are going to do four or five things just because they're great athletes in the NFL, that can't really happen. And it doesn't happen. You know, again, maybe there's one guy I can't think of, of a guy offhand, maybe you can, but no. you know, I remember miles Jack who just retired um, when he came out of UCLA and obviously he was a running back. He was a defensive player, six two, two forty five, great athlete. And, you know, people said, Oh, this guy's such a good athlete. You can line up him on the outside and he's going to cover Julio Jones. Well, you know, he's not going to cover Julio Jones and it takes yeah. nothing away from Miles Jack being a great athlete, but that stuff's not going to happen. Um, no. So you eventually, because people have to understand how defense is put in. When you start with OTAs or whatever they're called now, I know every there's different names when teams start up. Um, Train camp. Yeah. And I had this conversation with a former defensive coach who's been in the league for who was in the league for, you know, almost 40 years. So he's put in and installed a lot of defenses. And he basically told me that you have to start with your base defense. And then what you do is you, your base defense, you go through every permutation that you're going to face with an offense. Then you put in your nickel defense and you go through everything you're going to face with an offense. Then if you play dime, you put in your dime defense and you go through everything that you're going to possibly see from offenses. And, 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 you know, and all the, the, the adjustments, you know, with your defense that come off that. So a player needs to learn all that. And he has to line up in one place to know how to do that. Because don't forget, now we're in the NFL. It's totally different from the college game. So you get caught up in, you know, this guy is such a great athlete. He can do anything. Well, no, he might be able just to do that athletically. But he can't do it because of what he needs to learn in each specific role. And there's not enough time for that. So he has to play in one position. Yeah. And people talk about, oh, if he's, this guy's all over the place, it confuses the offense. Well, it also confuses the defense and it kind of limits what you can do. Correct. 
that he's he's where now he's our death backer he's our overhand guy now he's blitzing from the where okay so because that are, that that's that's affects being played everybody else on the defense so right. you have to teach all that yeah we can't I mean, spin I just, from two to one anymore because now he's over here it's like well now we just lost our advantage because they're in this offense and we spin from two to one whenever they do this right so it's it's you know, I think it sounds cool to talk about positionless players. I don't think it's really – when you talk to coaches, it's not really a factor at all. Not practical. Well, let's get practical with the five defenses we're most most looking forward to watching in 2023. Talked about a couple of these before in defenses it will be different. So let's start with the Dolphins. And last season, the Dolphins blitzed on – basically a third of their defensive snap, which ranked third in the league behind the Giants and Cardinals. They played two deep uh, on 159 opposing passing attempts, which was fourth lowest in the league. And so you're going from the Josh Boyer, Brian Flores defense to what Vic Fangio does. Needless to say, this will be different. Although you look at the 2021 Broncos, which is the last place Vic coached and he was running the defense. They were a little more, single high and a little more blitzy and a little more man than what might imagine. I mean, Vic I would agree, will, yes. Vic will more, because we all would talk about the Fangio scheme. Vic isn't really like that. He's not that guy. He will tailor his scheme to his personnel. I mean, like we was with the Niners in the early 2010s. They were basically, you know, base nickel execution base come after you. So when we talk about the Fangio scheme and you have to lead any defensive discussion with that, what are we really talking about and how does it relate to the dolphins with their personnel and what they want to do? Well, that's why it's a shame in some, in many ways that Jalen Ramsey, you know, yeah. may miss the season or certainly wouldn't play until December from everything I've heard, but they were going to have two corners that could line up and play man on the outside in, in Jalen Ramsey and Xavier uh, Howard. Um, again, we, I don't know, you know, none of us know now how Vic Fangio sees that, uh, but I think if you kind of look at the way people talk about the Vic Fangio defense, they talk about it as the starting point being a split safety structure, a shell structure. That's the starting point. But the thing that makes it so difficult is that's not always the end point. And, right. you know, what he's, if we're reducing this Doug to simplest terms, what basically that style of defense is asking quarterbacks to do is to have to read after the snap of the ball. Mm -hmm. And if you can slow down the decision-making process or muddy the decision-making process, um, then defensively, theoretically, you have an advantage. So, you know, the, I think the Vic Fangio defense, in many ways, like the West Coast offense, you know, right. is just kind of a, a 30,000 foot, you know, micro, uh, excuse me, macro term but there's so many elements and tweaks to it and different coaches, I think probably take different parts of it and, and use some more, some less depending on their personnel. But, you know, a major part of the Fangio defense is in some ways it's a zone based defense with man concepts because quarters at its core, one way to look at quarters as it's at its core is man with rules. Mm -hmm. So it's not man in the sense that, oh, you got him, you got him, you got him. But it ends up being man because you're matching somewhere along the line. You know, a term that's often used with that style defense is match, carry, deliver. Yes. You know, because you match, you carry, and then you deliver him at deliver that receiver time to someone else who right. then matches him. Yeah. So it's it has rules that you know that start as zone but end up being matching like man yeah match quarters is uh, our friend cody alexander who we both know uh, i know he yep. was at the films recently he has a website called match quarters and there you yep. go um this comes up we're not going to talk about the Chargers today but we are going to talk about the seahawks um why i mean is it as simple as the light box thing as to why the quote-unquote fangio teams are vulnerable to the run or is there more to it well, now you get into something that may be hard to to explain without people seeing it. But, you know, if you're playing with with two split safeties, OK, I've, in quarters, technically safeties do have a run responsibility, but they have a sort of a secondary run responsibility because they're not a first or second level defender. So the way the way a lot of coaches talk about it is either the term gap and a half or cancel gaps. You have to find a way 
to play all the gaps with one less player. So, you know, everything becomes math and numbers. Right. So really you're, you're trying to figure out how to play all the gaps theoretically with one less player. Cause you have two deep safeties and not one deep safety. You know, if you have one deep safety, then there's a safety that's in the box right. and he's becomes a, he can fit in, in the run game in a gap. Yep. Uh, go to the Vikings and I'm not going to rattle off all the stats. I'll just say, <laughs> cause we have X amount of time. In going from Ed Donatel to Brian Flores, this is a similarly uh, complete. This might be the most drastically altered defense because Flores is heavy blitz. It's zero coverage, but as he has said, Flores really likes to. And he probably got this from Belichick. Um, the the zero coverage from which you can zoom out into different things. He's really adept, and I think when we talk about cover zero, we don't talk enough about the things you can do out of it to confuse quarterbacks. Well, you know, zero has become kind of an interesting thing because one of the things that the Dolphins did a lot of, and and I don't know if they catalog it as zero or not, but obviously when Flores was with the Dolphins, I assume you'll see a lot of the same principles with the Vikings because that's what he does, right. um, is he would, you know, put six or seven, sometimes eight guys on the line of scrimmage. And again, some way in protection, you have to figure out how to account for that because you don't know who's going to come and who's not going to come. So right. you have to figure out a way based on your film study to handle that. Um, but the thing is, is even when he did play what we might talk about as zero, you know what we saw a lot? We saw a lot of the defensive backs playing 10 yards off the ball. So they weren't necessarily in press. And it wasn't necessarily pure man. In other words, depending on how the routes played out, they might switch because mm -hmm. it wasn't pure zero the way we think of pure zero, you know, where it's, hey, you got him and, and that's the way it is all across the field. So it has a zero look because there's no free player. There's no free safety in the middle of the field, but it doesn't necessarily play out the way we think of zero. Is the idea that it's to lure the quarterback into a false sense of whatever, like, oh, it's zero, I got this guy, and then all of a sudden... Well, the idea is to speed up the quarterback because at some point you are bringing people, you know, and you're bringing more than four at right. some point, and you're trying to confuse the protection, maybe get somebody in clean, but at the very least, speed up the quarterback. Um, I remember having this conversation when I did the book, The Games That Changed the Game with Dick LeBeau, mm -hmm. and he made a the point that, hey, when you blitz, and obviously Dick LeBeau, he, he didn't start zone blitz pressure, but he's the one who we think about when we think of zone blitz. Constantly. Acknowledged father thereof, yes. Right. Um, you know, he said, look, you're in the NFL, you're not necessarily going to get guys free, you know, but you're looking for matchups that favor you, and you're looking to speed up the quarterback, to speed up everything he does. Because if you speed up everything he does – then he's going to make mistakes. And, right. you know, I think that's what you're hoping to do. Hey, if you can get someone clean because you've broken down the protection, that's great. And I think Brian Flores is good at that. That does happen at times, just as Wink Martindale is good at that at times um, with the way that he structures his fronts to dictate yes. how teams will protect. But you're not going to do that, you know, 10 times a game. That that's It's the NFL. It's rare. There's a lot of smart coaches. So you're just looking to speed up everything and maybe confuse the protection, and it's just, you know, it just happens faster than the offense wants it to happen. It's almost like the drops in blitzes, the, the, the drops in blitz look affect the protections more than the straight blitzes because now you got an off, like a guard going, well, wait a minute, I thought I had him. Now, oh, oh shoot, I was, and then he's past you. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the things you're seeing a lot of too, uh, and you'll see it with Brian Flores as well, is you're seeing a lot of different tweaks in, in coverage based mm -hmm. on, on splits, based on formations, you know, so something that may start out as quarters then becomes cover two, something that starts out as quarters may become cover three, you know, th this is what teams are doing now, um, you know, and especially against veteran quarterbacks where you really want to try to change the picture because the things that made the Tom Brady, one of the things that make the Tom Brady's and the Drew Brees is so great was that they could win before the snap of the ball because sure. they saw what you were doing. So now you need to, to try to change the picture after the snap or have tweaks in, in what appear to be base coverage looks like cover four, but tweaks in it. So it changes and maybe it's not cover four. Maybe it becomes cover two. Maybe it becomes cover three. And again, you're just trying to 
you know, add time to the quarterback's thought process. Yep. Moving to the Eagles, and of course, this is a team in your backyard, uh, in the transition from Jonathan Gannon to Sean Desai, who's known as another Fangio guy. How do you think this might be different? I mean, under Gannon, they ran a ton of five-man fronts, very effective, not heavy blitz. I noticed in the preseason, they were throwing line, like like four-man fronts and throwing linebackers in, in, in blitz looks. Yeah. In and so I was like, okay. I, I think we're all curious. Where that, that goes. I think we're all curious to see how Sean Desai is different than Jonathan Gannon. He does have the Fangio background, so I'm sure there'll be some of the same methodology and some of the same principles. But it would not surprise me to see him be a little more pressure focused. It would not surprise me to see him use people in different ways. Um, you know, one of the things that I've, that I've seen and heard a little bit is, you know, James Bradbury playing inside, you mm -hmm. know, we could see that, you know, I think that we'll probably see some tweaks uh, with Sean Desai. Now my guess is because the defense was good a year ago, he's not going to make major changes. Obviously they've got some personnel things to work through. They're going to have two new linebackers, uh, they're going to have at least one new safety. Um, so obviously, depending on who, who those people are and what their skill sets are, which will be different than the skill sets of the previous players in those positions, you know, you have to understand the skill sets of who's out there. But I would, you know, there is a Fangio foundation that's probably at work here. But I think you're going to see more tweaks, more different things, because the kinds of things I just mentioned. Yeah. So that's maybe more of an offshoot where it's more active in the front and still that sort of match quarters idea in the back. Yeah. I mean, I think they'll start with that and then we'll see where they go. You know, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I've been learning so much about defense this off season. And it's got my head spinning because, <laughs> you know, defenses are constantly changing because of offenses, you know, as, as you know, from the book you did, um, you know, it, it, it's cyclical. It's all, there's always, changes that go on and different ways to try to do things. I mean, you know, like I said, I, I, I've spoken to a lot of defensive coaches and they talk about the way they match up now. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, they're trying to find an advantage because, you know, it's a passing league. And the last thing coaches want to do is, is be vanilla or give up 60 yard touchdown. So they're trying to do a lot of things that cause confusion. And it's, you know, they're, they're playing around, you know, they're way smarter than we are, Doug. You know, that's just yeah. the reality. They're coaches yeah. and it's, it's, you know, they're trying to figure stuff out. They do this for a living and it's all very real. So yeah. moving to Seattle last season, Greg, the Seahawks allowed 4.9 yards per rushing attempt tied with the bears for sixth worth in the league based on the 2023 preseason. I don't see that average improving much this regular season. And when you, I mean, we, so they're going light both literally and sort of philosophically on the interior guys the secondary, the back, I mean, we know Tariq Woolen, uh, Michael Jackson, although he had kind of a weird preseason. Devin Witherspoon comes in, maybe outside, maybe slot when he's healthy. Um, I think the match carry deliver, they got that in the in the secondary. Um, and with Julian Love coming over, they've got Quandre Diggs, who in my mind is the best deep third safety in the NFL. Love comes over, so they can do more of that too high stuff. I think last year the Seahawks were kind of betwixt in between with what they wanted to do versus the personnel they have. By the way, I think the Vikings could run into that this year because they're maybe a year or two away from having the players they want. But with Seattle, what do you see just based on how they've put this together, um, especially because they've got some interesting, you know, they brought in Draymond Jones. They've got some interesting guys on the edge, but I don't know if just the, I mean, they brought Bobby Wagner back. Jordan Brooks may be there for week one. I it's kind of like the middle of that front might really up in them. Possibly. Um, you know, I, the, one of the things that I've taken away from conversations with, with coaches this offseason, defensive coaches, is that the corner position is now the most important position on defense because you can scheme pressure, okay? You know, coaches can scheme pressure. Um, but if you have to cover up for your corners <laughs> – that limits a lot of what you can do because now your safeties are kind of out of the mix because they have to be involved in helping your corners. So now all of a sudden you've got less coverage options. You've got less pressure options. So, you know, I, I think one of the things we saw a year ago is the Seahawks were not a big pressure team in no. terms, you know, they certainly couldn't rush the quarterback with four and they're hoping some younger players, you know, can, can come along and do that. Um, they're hoping, um, and, and I'm drawing a blank on his name, the Minnesota kid who's in his second year. 
Um, oh, Boya Mafe. Yeah, yeah they're hoping he really can become a, a really I good. They've been working with their edge rushers this preseason, and who better? And, and that's that's shown up. And Derek Hall, the kid they got from Auburn. In the I love that kid on tape, by the way. Oh, my God, the measurables. And it shows yeah. that he does a shot out of a cannon on every play. Yeah. So they've got some guys. Yeah, so they're hoping, of course, that they can do more, you know, get pressure. I'm talking about on third down, you know, your long yard situations. Create pressure with four as opposed to having to constantly scheme it. But, you know, I think the corner position, we know what Woolen did a year ago as a rookie. Jackson was actually very solid a year ago. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I almost wonder if he's hurt because the preseason was like, ooh, this is not Yeah, so and, and I mean, you've indicated to me I, that, that Bryant, the other rookie who played in the slot last year, that they moved him to safety. They're kind of having him yeah. do both. Yeah, yeah we'll see how the season starts because if Witherspoon's not ready, you know, Bryant may be the slot corner. Yeah. Um because obviously they signed, you know, Love, Julian Love, and he's going to be the safety with Diggs, who's a very good player, as mm -hmm. you indicated. Um, so, you know, I think the main thing for them is how they feel about their ability to rush the quarterback. Mm -hmm. Because then, you know, I think defensively, Clint Hurt can do more things from a coverage perspective. Because if you can't rush the quarterback, you got to be a little careful in your coverage because the quarterback has too much time to yeah. sit there and, and, and kind of figure out what you're doing. So, you know, we'll see what they do. But I think, you know, Woolen is, is a good player, had a great rookie year, and he's a phenomenal athlete. I mean, he's everything you want. He's 6'4". He can run. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I can't tell you how many times last year watching Seattle's tape, I would see Woolen look like he was beaten. He wasn't beat. Nope. You know, just because he's so long and he, and he can go. move. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so we'll see. But I think they're going to be a really intriguing offense. Because, you know, Wagner, from everything I heard from the Rams, Wagner was outstanding a year ago. Yep. So I, you know, I don't think he's lost anything yet. We'll no. see. You know, he is getting older, but he didn't lose it last year. No, he's still, if you want to try a slant in his area, well, good luck with that. Um, he, he was never the 30 yards up the seam guy, but he's not that now. He never was that. He's more, you know, the box guy, but on a Hall of Fame track. We've talked a lot about the Fangio guys and different iterations of it to oversimplify it. Is the light box different coverage thing? Is it is an acquiescence to NFL offenses saying, okay, we're going to give up the run? It's kind of like the Belichick Thurman Thomas thing, right? Right. I'm, yeah. Where we'll let Thurman Thomas run for 100 and whatever yards, but you're not going to throw on us. Is is the, and again, the Fangio, it, everyone does things differently, but that idea, that concept, is it sort of an acquiescence to, yeah, we'll give up the run. We don't really care, but we're going to, we're going to limit what you can do as a passer. Is that kind of the general idea? I mean, I think that's an element of it, but I also think the other thing with split safety and which is, is really important is, you know, when you play split safety, you take away the seams. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think what started to happen with cover three, and unless you're going to play, you know, the old Saban bromide rip Liz, where you have your, your, your hook to crawl defenders in cover three run vertically with number two, you know, which teams do obviously, but it still creates some other holes. Um, so unless you're going to do that foundationally, you know, if you're going to play cover three, the seams are available. And, you know, I think you don't want to give up seams. You know, I remember when when um, Rod Rust, who you know who that is, yep. um, he used to come sit with me. He passed away about five years ago. But when he quit coaching, he lived in South Jersey. And for about four Just or five Patriots years. Patriots head coach for a while, longtime defensive coordinator, kind of invented quarters, basically. Correct. That's that's Rod Rust. And he would say the first thing you should do as an offense, and he's a defensive coach. But he always said to me, as a defensive coach, you have to know how anything you do can get beat. You have to understand what beats what you want to do because you want to make sure that you don't get beat by that. Um, he said the first thing you should do as a coach, as an offensive coach in the past game, is attack the seams and find out how a defense is going to play them. And, you know, if you're playing straight cover three, kind of the stuff, you know, the cover three that's taught in high school, you, you know, where Country the corners have the deep thirds closer. and the safety, the yep. post safety has the, the, the deep third and your underneath defenders have the two flats and the hook to curls. You know, if you're going to do that, then, you know, the seams are available. So you have to – an offense should attack the seams and find out how a defense wants to play it. And if you're playing split safety, obviously the seams are not there. The Cleveland Browns, Greg, we don't really talk about their defense because of the obvious story with their quarterback. Um, but in 2022, Miles Garrett was responsible for 18 of the team's 37 sacks, eight of the team's 23 quarterback hits, 
47 of teams, 118 quarterback hurries. Not the ratio you want. So they bring in Jim Schwartz as their new DC. I want to get into Jim in a minute, but they also got uh, Zadari Smith, Davlin Talmanson, and Obana Okoronkwo, Okoronkwo, excuse me, as the other edge rusher. Smith is kind of an inside outside guy. Delman Tomlinson is that guy, just, you know, the meat in the middle. Miles Garrett, we all know, is, you know, he's a he's kind of a marvel. But the combination of Schwartz and these new linemen and kind of a sneaky good secondary if everyone stays healthy, I kind of think this Browns defense might be one this year where everything kind of comes together. Yeah, it'll be a different defense. They got a lot of talent, by the way, but it'll be a different yeah. defense. So what you're going to do is see the wide nine, okay? So you're going to have Garrett on one side and likely Ladarius Smith on the other side. He um, was already doing that with Ladarius in the preseason, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what you're going to see. Now, keep in mind, because of the wide nine and the structure of the front, more often than not, it's a single safety structure. Mm-hmm. But he has two safeties that fit what he wants to do because Grant Delpit can play in the box, and Juan Thornhill is a very good back-end safety. That's what he is. That's what he did with the Chiefs. Yep. So – you know, that he has the people to do what he wants to do. And it's my understanding that he brought in Jim Washburn as a defensive consultant. And Jim uh, Washburn is the father, basically, of the wide. I don't want to say that. Maybe he's not the first guy that did it. But he's well known as the guy who, you know, really deals with that. And, you know, and he's he's tough. And he gets guys have to play. shorthand with father of... With, with football because everything has 11 fives. Right, right. So I didn't really mean to say that, yeah. but the point is he, he's a <laughs> wide not- nine guy and they certainly with Garrett and Smith can do that. But because yeah. when you, when you widen your front, now you're creating gaps. So you need that extra player in the box or to be available in the box. And that's why you tend to see more single high structures because you need the safety to be involved, but Delpit can do that. He's a big guy. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I think you're going to see a different defense. They tend to play a lot of a lot of zone as opposed to a ton of man, although everybody plays man to some degree. But you'll see more zone. And he does a lot of cool things on the back end. I remember with Philly, you used, you know, I used to talk to Fran Duffy all the time, you know, and you know Fran, yeah, uh, Fran. the Eagles in their video department. And Fran's phenomenal. Yeah. And um, we would talk all the time about these coverage looks from Jim Schwartz and we'd go back and forth is that cover two is that cover three invert is that you know and you know he does does a lot of things that are kind of hard to figure so you know that's what he does uh but you're gonna see a four-man pass rush i can tell you that well they got denzel Ward, who went healthy and you know on his game right. a top 10 corner in my mind they got greg Newsom, who i love coming out of college they have martin emerson who i also liked a lot so that that back five it gets really interesting back there yeah, it'll be really interesting, and, and we'll see how it plays out. But it'll be different. It'll be a fun defense to kind of keep track of this year. Well, that's that's our top five defenses we're looking forward to watching in the 2023 regular season, which, when we are with you next week, we'll be talking about matchup-wise. Very much looking forward to that, Greg, because now, now the rubber meets the road. Yes, it does. I'm looking forward to that, Doug. All right. Greg, as always, thanks a lot, and we'll talk next week. Thank you.